Hi. It's a bit weird, weird to start to talk about death with jokes and with smiles. But this is like what most people, how most people react when they think about what I've been doing for the past 40 years. So, cheesemaker, if you think that's weird. My first job was cartoonist for a radio station. Uh, I started hacking computers at 14, so a little bit later than Andre. I decided to quit that and go and study medicine and become a plastic surgeon. Did the whole thing, got my degree, then decided to start a design company because I was designing websites in 1996 where internet was like, what is that? And I've done many other crazy things. I got a master's in theater, I've worked in fintech and banking. I've done a lot of other things. I've run a marathon in North Korea, full marathon with preparing only with for one month and one week. So going from three kilometers to 42.2. And I guess like looking back at my life, I'm more like probably if anything is impossible and you tell me this is not possible, then I'm going to be like, sign me up. Where do I, how do I start it? But being this kind of person who always needs excitement, needs important stuff to do, I realized that five years ago, I didn't have anything like that. I was in a very, you know, you want to be in this like, yes, hell yes situation, but I was in a very meh period. And that lasted for a couple of months, maybe close to one year. And then I went to a program at MIT. I don't know if you know much about MIT, but it's like a very crazy university and they ask you to have something like a crazy idea that you've never worked on before. So does this thing work or not anymore? Yes, that was the date when I went to MIT and everything changed. So yeah, MIT is crazy and I went with a crazy idea and my idea was what if you could take someone's second life avatar and link it to their Facebook profile and email. So when they would die, the avatar instead of just like sitting there and bumping into other avatars of living players would be able to somehow interact with other players the same way the living person would have done. Would that mean that that person would not be dead anymore? As I said, like, MIT is crazy, so this is normal for MIT. And we started working, and we started, like, developing, like, lots of ideas, concepts, talking to people, you know, trying to figure out how to do this. And we realized that instead of a scenario that's, like, more like Black Mirror scenario, where you would build an avatar based on someone's digital footprint, you would do that for a living person. So most of you would have 40 years to refine this avatar, to make it a lot like you. So it would be a realistic avatar. We put up a page, we started talking to other people, and then something happened. We got a call two hours after we posted something on the internet, and someone said, guys, there's an article in Boston Globe about what you're doing. And we're like, no way, like, this is a joke, this is not something serious. And we opened the online uh, edition of Boston Globe and there it was. Eternity founders at MIT are trying to allow you to talk to your deceased ones. And two hours later, a TV station came and did a news piece with us. Yeah, that crazy. That night, we were broadcasted on CNN worldwide and then for the rest of the program, we couldn't work anymore because we had interviews, emails from people, like all the six members in the team could not do anything but reply to emails, talk to journalists, talk to investors, and try to figure out what the hell was happening. We failed the program, of course. Back, we went back home, and again, like, MIT is similar like, you know, to the Hogwarts University in Harry Potter. Seems like another world. When you go back home, when you come to Romania, and you're like, what has just happened? Was this for real? So was, how do you build something like this in Romania, in Yash, where I'm originally from? 
After a couple of months figuring out how to get out of my previous company, I decided, hell, I'm just going to put all my money and start working on this. And it was not because I discovered some magic AI or because I did anything uh, special. It was because I received emails from people who had terminal cancer, leukemia, had a couple of more months to live, and they said, please, please, please let us in your private beta program. We had 42,000 people who had signed up and nothing, no line of code, no AI written. So I said, hell yeah. This is the moment I've been waiting for. I'm going to start building this. I have no idea how. I have an idea where I'm going to get more money except my savings, but I started. So after more than one year, we managed to launch the first version, which was kind of like an autobiography but made of videos. So you would go and record videos of yourself answering various questions that you would find in an autobiography. And then we failed. Nobody wanted to use this. We started something else. We started this chatbot, which basically acts like your personal autobiographer and asks things. And then we create an avatar that are, is able to represent you and talk to other people. And we also did an avatar for Steve Jobs based on information about him from his books. And you can kind of like interact with him, but it takes him like one minute to give a reply. Then we ran out of money. My team fell apart. I had to come back from San Francisco where I was back at that time, move back in Yash, move with my parents. I only had probably like $500 left in my pocket. And for six months I lived with my parents and my mom would cook and do the laundry. My dad would give me his car keys and secretly put money into my pocket. I felt like a complete failure at almost 40 years old. But funny thing, there's also a good part in this because living with your parents at 40 is super awesome. <laughs> I mean, think of this, you're 40, you don't have a job, you don't need a salary, you, what is that retirement? And you stay with your parents and they take care of you and you really, really appreciate that. And I had more time to spend with my friends until I had to figure like what the hell I'm doing next. And one of my best friends, my best friend, who's basically a childhood friend, more than a brother to me, he's also a TEDx speaker. Uh, his name is Ioan Dan Niculescu. Um, uh, he's, we call him Roca. And he's a very, very special person, not only because he was the one who did the branding and social media campaign for Klaus Johannes as president, but because he's a very, very good friend to a lot of people and a lot of dogs and a lot of stray cats. And he has a unique outlook in life and he supported me. And I'm just going to let you how he sees this thing about death, about what you leave behind from his TED talk. De la, de la Ocean Shapus aveam să aflu de fapt și de drept cele mai importante lucruri pe care le-am aflat. Și dacă am învățat de la a pus că este foarte, foarte important să lași o culoare și o imagine frumoasă în urma ta după ce ai strălucit, la un moment dat, de la Ocean aveam să, să învăț să nu mai fie frică, să nu mai fie frică să accept provocări, să nu mai fie frică să visez mare, să nu mai fie frică să mă parung. Six months later, I had moved back home. I was back on my feet financially. And on this date, I received a phone call in the evening. It was one of my friends. And she said, I've heard some terrible, terrible news. I heard the rumor that Roca had an accident. I was like worried. I, started, I called him, nobody would answer. I started calling everybody I knew without trying to panic anyone. I called the police, I called 112, I called the ambulance. And 30 minutes later, I, I found the, the bad thing. He was gone. And those have been the worst days of my life. I don't know if you've lost a dear one, someone very close. Probably some of you have, some of you will have, will do. But the thing like, to go and tell his girlfriend, to tell his sister, to go and tell his mom, then go and, you know, recognize him at the morgue, bring him back home, choose a coffin, organize the funeral, 
is definitely something that I don't, I don't even find the words to tell how deep it can affect you. But it sounds weird. Even in those three days, I could find things I was grateful for. I was grateful I had someone he, like him in my life. I was grateful I had spent time with him and I didn't feel like I should have spent one day more with him. And I felt grateful seeing how many people came from all around the world to be at his funeral. It was the most beautiful funeral I've ever seen because of those people, because they came and left things in his coffin for his final journey like a Egyptian pharaoh, because they played Pink Floyd in the church for his last journey, and because all those people stay and wanted to be with him on the last journey, to say goodbye. And not only say goodbye, but stay close to everyone else for the couple of weeks that followed so that we could not fall apart. One of the things that they suggested to do on his birthday, this was the date when he was supposed to turn 38. They said, let's get together and celebrate him. We're like 30, 40 people, just go out in the woods, sit on the grass, take our dogs, take our you know, small blanket, listen to the music he loved. But then this changed into something different. Instead of 40 people, we had 2,500 people who came. In three days, it turned from a small picnic party into a festival with five top bands, Alternosfera, Byron, Firma, Fine It's Pink. It became the most beautiful day in my life, so short after three days, four days, one week that have been like the worst in my life. And that's all because of his friends. And this was possible because Roca had some very, very good friends and some very good, good, crazy friends. This was 2016. In 2017, the number of people who came grew to 25,000 people. This year grew to 30,000 people. And we had 40 bands and DJs who came and did everything for free and all the proceedings were given as charity. And Rock Another World, how we call the festival, is Currently, I think like the biggest charity festival. This year, we, next year, we expect 50,000 people in Yash, hopefully some of you. And I can't describe what you feel when you're there because of one person. This reminded me of a very important thing Rock had said to me at some point. And of course, like the many things he said, like you go over them and you don't remember them until they make sense. And he said, what we do for, other, for ourselves, we take with ourselves. What we do for others lives on. And I think when Rock and Other World happened, I really understood what he was saying. I don't know if you know, but we die three times. First time is when they can't take care of ourselves anymore. The second time is when they put us in the grave. And the third time is when our name, in, when our name is spoken for the last time, when we are forgotten. And you might wonder what happened and how this relates to what I was doing to Eternity Me. And the way it relates is that I decided that I don't want Roca to die. I don't want anybody to die and be forgotten. I don't want people to go through the exp this experience where death is only a traumatic place, but I want to help people understand how death can be something meaningful, how ca it can help you 
live better, live happier, have a more meaningful journey in life. I want to create this thing which is called digital immortality. And we got back on track and today we're still working on eternity, which basically is this app right now that creates your, it's still in beta, it's still in R&D. Uh, we still need a lot of money, a lot of people and a lot of talents to build it. But it's basically an app that collects everything about you and writes your life story automatically. Everything you do every day based on your Facebook, based on your smartphone, based on your conversations with other people. We have, as I said, like more than 40,000 people uh, on board. It's been chosen to be one of the top 100 projects in the world that will change the future by Victoria and Albert Museum. And even if it's not a reality, it's something that I'm really willing to dedicate my life to. And in closing, I want you to think about something. There's a, you are around like 700 people here in the room. During my talk, three times as much people died in the world. Can you imagine how unprepared their families and friends were about that? Can you imagine what this means to discover you have to have to go and look at someone's body and confirm that event? Can you imagine what it means to organize a funeral to choose a coffin or to tell a mother that their child has died? Can you imagine, can you think of what words you have to tell to the other people instead of like, my sincere condolences to help them go through that trauma? I'm frustrated, I'm very angry because technology has done so many things to change our lives. And if you look all around us, everything is so different than 10 years ago or 20 years ago because of technology but it hasn't done anything to change how we deal with death. We still bury our people, we still mourn them, we still go through the same trauma as we've done for the past couple of hundreds of years. And maybe you should think back at what Roca was saying. Stop being afraid of death, pretending it won't happen. Think that the ocean has the courage, get the courage to deal with it, and think how you can use technology to change this thing. For me, it's simple. It's, it's a life mission. It's something that is definitely both, living, both worth living for and both dying for. Thank you.